Hello, welcome back to a new video. In this video, we're going to cover how private equity accelerates wealth inequality inside of capitalism. So we're going to let our function f at a time t be the fund level equity value. And we're going to decompose it into four generators. So f of t is equal to our EBITDA margin at a time t where EBITDA stands for earnings before income, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So we have that times our mar market multiple M at T times our equity retention at a time T times ownership share at a time T. That's our four generators. Now we want to see how our fund level equity value changes over time. So we're going to use the partial derivative of f in respect to time. And that's to say we have the partial derivative in respect to time of epsilon sub m, which is our EBITDA margin, our market multiple m, our equi equity retention epsilon sub r, and our ownership value Phi. Of course, when we apply this operator to this product of four generators, we have to use the product rule. So this is equal to partial epsilon sub m in respect to time times m times epsilon sub r times phi. Now we have to do this three more times because we have four terms. So we have the partial m in respect to time times epsilon sub m times epsilon sub r times phi plus the partial derivative acting on our equity retention in respect to time times the EBITDA margin times our market multiple times the ownership value and finally we have the partial derivative of ownership value in respect to time times our EBITDA margin, times the market multiple, times the equity retention. So these are going to generate our four value drivers for our fund level equity value. So what can we do now? Well, we're going to rewrite these two terms here and you'll see why in just a second. So let's go ahead and take the partial of epsilon sub m in respect to time, multiply it into our generators as we see with our partial m in respect to time with our generators, of course. Nothing's changed so far. I don't need to go through again what all of these are. Now we have partial epsilon sub r in respect to time now EBITDA margin multiplied into our market multiple is called total enterprise value which we will denote T sub ENT times phi plus partial phi in respect to time now the EBITDA margin times the market multiple times equity retention equals total equity which we will denote T sub EQ Now what we're going to do is switch over to a discrete case because with derivatives this is imagining that this is a continuous operation but in reality we might have to rely on things such as for example a quarterly report or you have to wait for a, a CO or someone to close the books for us to actually have our data. We don't have a continuous stream of data to fill in for our data generators not in reality anyways and so for every delta x in respect or every partial x in respect to time we're going to replace that with delta x divided by delta t so now instead of an operator in respect to time acting on x we're now having a discrete change of x divided by a discrete change in time where x 
then becomes the average value of x from a time one to time two. We're gonna replace that here. So instead of partial f in respect to time, we now have delta f divided by delta t is equal to, well, we have delta epsilon sub m divided by delta t. Now one may feel inclined to just put an average value around the three terms here and with uh, the market multiple as well as the equity retention and the ownership share, but that won't really work because as it turns out, the average of products is not equal to the product of averages. So we actually have to put in an average value around each of our generators here, like that, and that's just for the first term. Let's write that out so you can see if that's an epsilon there. Kind of horrible writing there, but we'll continue nonetheless. And now we'll do this for the rest of the three terms. We have delta m divided by delta t with the average of the EBITDA margin times the average of the equity retention times the average of ownership share. Now we just do the same thing, just keep going down here. We have delta epsilon sub r over delta t times the average of our total enterprise value times the average of ownership share plus delta phi over delta t times the average of our total equity value. Now we're gonna multiply through by delta t to make this look a lot nicer. So our discrete change of our fund level of equity value is equal to delta of epsilon sub m times the average of m times the average of epsilon sub r times the average of phi plus delta m times the average of epsilon sub m times the average of epsilon sub r times the average of phi plus delta of epsilon sub r times the average of our total enterprise value times the average of phi plus delta phi times the average of our total equity value Okay, so now that we have that, what can we actually do? Well, it turns out these are four value drivers written now in our discrete terms, which corresponds. So we have delta F, this first term here, is called the EBITDA growth, which is a value driver, so we denote V, sub EG, where EG stands for EBITDA growth, plus our second term here, which corresponds to multiple expansion. So we have V sub ME plus our third term here, which corresponds to the leverage effect. So we have V sub LE plus our fourth term here, which corresponds to fund ownership impact. So V sub FO. So we have our EBITDA growth plus our multiple expansion, plus our leverage effect, plus the fund ownership impact. Okay, well, the EBITDA growth plus the multiple expansion is called unlevered return. And we'll write this out here on levered return. Okay, so we can simplify this as follows. Delta F is therefore equal to 
v sub ur, our unlevered return, plus v sub le, our leverage effect, plus v sub fo, our fund ownership impact. Even more nicely, perhaps, we can take the unlevered return, and when that adds into the leverage effect, this is called the isomeric return, which will denote V sub IR, that is isomeric return. So we can simplify this even further. Delta F, the discrete change, and our fund level equity value is equal to the sum of our isomeric return and our fund ownership impact term. And this is an equation that you would see used in the realm of private equity. But notice something interesting here. This does not rely on any, any type of revenue generation. There can be negative revenue, there can be no revenue, there can be positive revenue. What matters is that there's some type of dynamic shifting between monetary hands, and this can be a non-zero effect. So how does this fit in with wealth inequality and capitalism? Well, let's consider an equation called the Fokker-Planck equation, which is to say the partial derivative of a wealth distribution in respect to time is equal to minus the partial derivative in respect to omega, and we'll get into what all these terms mean here in a second. So we have minus the partial derivative in respect to omega of A of omega times our wealth distribution plus one half the second partial derivative in respect to omega of D of omega times our wealth distribution. Well, so wealth distribution rho as a function of omega and t. So we have wealth distribution. Our term here, A, is economic drift. And our term D here is economic diffusion. So your wealth growth is going to be captured by our economic drift and different types of things like policies and let's say liberal reform is going to be found inside of your economic diffusion term. So under capitalism we have to have the following condition because if capital accumulation is your boundary condition for which you keep a capitalist system functioning whatsoever, this economic drift term A must be greater than zero. But there's a consequence to this. And the consequence of that is called the Piketty effect. So this generates a Pareto tail, a heavy Pareto tail in the case of a realistic capitalist economy. And the Pareto law is what we call the 80-20 rule. That is to say, on average, that 20% of people will own 80% of the wealth in an economic sense. But the rate at which this is greater than zero, the rate at which this generates a Pareto tell, tells you how that distribution is biased, this wealth distribution, how it's biased over a population, and how quickly income inequality, in, or excuse me, income inequality grows within that society. And so this, is, uh, this corresponds to what we can call the Piketty effect, that inequality is guaranteed under capitalism because if A is not, if A is not greater than zero, 
then this is not a stable solution to the Fokker-Planck equation, which by the way, the Fokker-Planck equation is equivalent to an open system Schrodinger equation, which itself is a generalization of Newton's second law. So this is basically Newton's second law for an economic distribution. And under capitalism, this A cannot be a stable solution to this equation unless it's greater than zero when capital accumulation is our boundary term. So this inevitably leads to wealth inequality. And the problem is this happens no matter what, even if we use liberal reform to target this diffusion term here. Because no matter what we do on this diffusion term, and if we act, say if we act as a, uh, we treat it like a dampening term to the economy, they can just increase the value of A here to make a, a stronger Pareto tail for this to lead to a Pareto tail even quicker. So there's nothing that you can do within just this diffusion term that would change the general economic structure for which capitalism remains stable. So liberal reform is simply going to be inefficient to actually target the effective structure that leads to income inequality as A becomes greater and greater than zero over time. So then how does private equity accelerate this process? Well, A is already technically a form of velocity in an economic phase space. So if we have delta F greater than zero, which someone who works in private equity ought to hope that that's greater than zero, otherwise what's the purpose? If that's greater than zero, Let's actually write this better. If delta F is greater than zero, this accelerates our drift term, A. It just accelerates even faster, such that the derivative of A in respect to time is now greater than zero. Not just the drift itself being greater than zero, its derivative is also greater than zero. So this just absolutely accelerates income inequality any time that delta F is greater than zero. So when private equity firms, for example, buy up shares of a business, whether it be, for example, private equity firms like KKR, Vanguard, or someone like Blackstone, well, it's easier to destroy a business or a market than it is to create a, a, a business, jobs, or a market and this doesn't rely on positive revenue and so actually they have the incentive to allow that company or job or market to collapse to increase the rate at which delta F is greater than zero and so they have the incentive to debt load a company and then ultimately liquidate them when the company can no longer hold itself together so this just accelerates the issue so then I leave one question to you as the viewer what happens when private equity firms buy up loyalty in the government and then the government's built up with trillions and trillions of dollars of debt and then they're already debt loaded? What happens when they're liquidated under private equity? I'll let you, the viewer, answer that for yourself.